All right, class, we're back, and we're going to be talking today about the cardiac arrest. And for whatever reason, again, we didn't get there in time. They didn't. They waited to call. They've been having chest pain all day long, and finally, the the old muscle said, "You know what? We're done." Uh, they go into cardiac arrest. All right, and um, it, it's very unfortunate. But again, now we get called. We need to bring them out. So there's all kinds of things that cause sudden cardiac death. Um, and we have to understand, and the, the more that we understand what it is that caused it, the better the chance that we are going to have to get them back. And I, and I can't stress that enough. We got to figure out what it is that caused it. And, we, and the way that we do that is history. We come to the scene, and granted, we've got a lot of things to be doing but one of the things that we got to be doing while we're doing starting CPR, while we are securing that airway, is talking to these folks and figuring out what happened. Do I treat somebody who stuck their finger in a light socket very different from the guy that just come off the dialysis machine? Absolutely, okay? We need to ask exactly what was going on with this patient, okay? If they knew anything that happened, did this person just been a car wreck? Did, have they been doing drugs? We really need to find out and use our clues that are around the scene to figure out what it is. The other thing that is not on this list, which I was kind of surprised about, was, was dysrhythmias, okay? And, and that is a big one, the dysrhythmias, okay? Um, that one should definitely be on this list, okay? So what's going to cause sudden cardiac death? Now, again, is it high, I guess it would follow technically under a hypoxia, and that's true. But again, uh, the hypoxia part is, is that the, the vessel is blocked up, and that's why they're not getting any blood flow to it. So let's figure out what it is that's caused the arrest. And again, I think that that is very situationally dependent. We need to truly talk to these people, talk to the bystanders, find out something. And again, look around your scene. Do I see something? Do I see drugs involved? Do I see, uh, did they just recently have surgery and they got a big old gigantic scar on their knee from when they just, uh, and again, the way that we find this, a quick physical exam, all right? Pupillary responses. Again, do I get there and their pupils are up and to the right? Okay, well, they can sweat. They might have had a stroke. Uh, do, are, are they sopping wet? Uh, hey, they just drowned, okay? So let's use our clues to figure out what it is that's caused them to go into the arrest, okay? Uh, one of the things that I stress with you guys about treating an arrest, find a reversible cause, okay? Even when we're retrying to restart a heart, when we give an epinephrine, it's for the purpose of restarting the heart, but that's one of the reasons why we would do so. So again, do your initial assessment, start your CPR, Check your your EKG for dysrhythmias, all right? Um, and then make sure, uh, find out that downtime, all right? Was any bystander doing CPR immediately or did that take, a, did that take time for it to happen, all right? So what is our management goals? Is to resuscitate the patient, all right? Uh, remember, uh, the patient does not die in the back of your truck. Well, unfortunately, we're gonna talk about this here in just a second and uh, yeah, again, we attempt a resuscitation. Again, return of spontaneous circulation is when they have a pulse on their own. We don't have to give them a pulse. And then what our real goal is, is this guy right here, survival. That's where we want them to walk out of the air, if they walk out of the hospital, all right? Now, understand that this road to survival, number one, you got to have this in order to, in order to even get to here, you got to have this, Okay. But this is a, this is a multi-week process, probably. They're probably going to be in the hospital uh, six to ten days after a, a, such a, an acute event. Longer if longer that the arrest went. Okay. So again, uh, basic life support. The, our role there, high quality CPR. Okay. The real way to help to stop a cardiac arrest is this right here is the sp manage the specific dysrhythmia, okay? More importantly, manage that specific dysrhythmia before they go into the arrest, okay? 
and, and in the case, do on to others before they do it on to you. This is the, the absolute truth. If we can prevent them from going into cardiac arrest, right there, their chances of living significantly increase. Significantly. All right? So, again, your CPR, uh, very important. Establishing an advanced airway uh, and, and getting your advanced airway placed. And then, again, establish your IV access as well. All right? Once we get to that, then we figure out, now they use this one here. This is the, if I'm doing a, a let's say a shockable versus a not shockable, okay? Um, your assistantly PEAs, these guys not shocking, um, and how do we manage it? So uh, we'll start out with this one. And I actually like this algorithm a little bit better for explaining what to do in cardiac arrest. Um, you start CPR, high, uh, attach your monitor, check the rhythm. If we got V-fib or pulseless V-tac, we are going to cardio, we're going to defibrillate it, sorry. We're going to confederate it. High quality CPR is going on during this entire time, all right? Start your IV, get your advanced airway placed, okay? And, and then, by the way, and here's the cool thing about the advanced airway, and this is, uh, again, Qualitative waveform capnography, okay? Yeah, that's a kind of a big one, all right? I want to see what their capno is because, again, capno tells me how good my CPR quality is doing, okay? If I've got a capno around 20 to 25, great. If they go suddenly from 15 to 25 up to 50, I know I've got a return of spontaneous circulation long before I can probably feel the pulse of it, all right? And again, your other therapies here is to try to figure out reversible causes, all right? So remember when I said you got to know your H's and T's. We did a whole video on H's and T's. Gang, you got to know them. Now, again, this is the 2010 algorithm, and I got some bad news for you. This one hasn't really changed, okay? This algorithm truly has not changed in the last 10 years, all right? So again, continuous CPR. Pulse check, rhythm check. Epi is my first drug. And then it depends on whether or not I need to, what rhythm they're in. If they're in V-fib or V-tac, we're going to give them amiodarone, and that's for refractory. So what we will usually do is that first round is going to be getting my IV started, okay? Getting my airways in, all right? The second round after I defibrillate them, Epi, one milligram. Third round, amiodarone. Okay, amiodarone, again, they're dead person, 300 milligram bolus, second dose is going to be 150 milligrams, all right? Uh, and again, but, but usually the pattern here, by the way, for a V-fib or V-tac arrest is going to be epi, shock, amio, and that's our 300 milligrams, shock, epi, if they're still in it, right? Now, again, is this going to change potentially during your arrest cycle? Yeah, absolutely. Can you send a patient into a systole? Can you put them into a PEA? Absolutely. If they're not in V-fib, V-tac, should I think about giving amiodarone? No, merely throw that out, okay? Because are there other drugs that I can be giving, by the way? One other little sidebar here, okay? One little sidebar with this. Um, so this is if they continue to be in V-fib slash V-tac without a pulse. If they're not, but one other thing you can do is start giving drugs to correct these reversible causes, okay? Now, that's a lot to do in the first 10 minutes of a code, and I understand that. So organize yourself in what you want to do. Figure out how they arrest it. If I think that this is because of the dysrhythmia, I need to focus on those dysrhythmias. If I think it's due to hypoxia, I'm thinking get my airway, okay? If I'm thinking that there's a, um, a hydrogen ion issue, they've been short of breath for three days, and now we got to the point, I got a hypoxia problem, and they're probably so acidic. This is a good time maybe to think about, do I need to counter it with sodium bicarb or just good ventilations, okay? By the way, the initial treatment for your, your acidosis is good ventilations, good CPR. And then try 
your your sodium bicarb to create a met, to correct any type of metabolic acidosis. All right. If they are at a renal dialysis center, it's probably an electrolyte problem. They pulled off too much. I'm going to be giving them an ample calcium first off. Okay. So guys, it really is dependent upon what happened and what's going on with the patient. It's wonderful that we would love to go down this algorithm. But the thing about it is, is that there's going to be some times when, when there, and the patient changes so fast that this circular algorithm is going to serve you much, much better. Okay. Now here's the cool thing. If I get to the point where I do a pulse check rhythm check and they have a pulse and they have a perfusing rhythm, congratulations, that's a return of spontaneous circulation. And then we're going to go out to our post-arrest care. And that post-arrest care, again, very good, very important, okay? So we want to prevent them from going back into an arrest state. And actually, once they come out of it, most of the time, they actually will keep the organized rhythm. They'll go into some sort of PEA. Again, if they come back into a PEA, that's okay. Start right back here, okay? Start back again, all right? It's okay. So again, manage your dysrhythmias, be alert, and then transport rapidly, okay? Make sure that if you don't have a definitive airway at that point, that you get a definitive airway, all right? So post-arrest care, and a lot of times this is where we, where we fall down. Now, I will also tell you there's been a little bit of change for this. Uh, this is the 2010 algorithm, but the only real change, by the way, in, in this is 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 this guy right here we're not doing hypothermia in the field and there's been some changes to that hypothermia protocol okay um inducing hypothermia we try to go down 32 to 36 for 24 hours and then slowly bring them back up the real goal though is to get them again to the to somewhere where we can do the reperfusion therapy okay if i think that the person's having an nmi we don't take them to Bubba's emergency room. We're going to take them to where there is a cath lab, especially if they are arrested. Taking them to Bubba's emergency room is not going to cure their problem, okay? And all that hard work that you just did, getting that patient back, is not going to work. So when you get them back, when you get them back, return to spontaneous circulation, we got to do the ABCs and... This is where I break out my Michael Jackson on you guys. So assure the airway, all right? Assure the airway. If we don't have an advanced airway in, put it in. Assure the breathing. This is, falls under that oxygen and ventilation, okay? If they don't have Capno on by this point, they really need it on, okay? And then C is assert, uh, assure that the circulation continues, all right? And by the way, that would be one to two liters of fluid, okay? And then one plus two, that, or that also means a 12 lead, okay? If they haven't got a 12 lead yet, we need to do it, okay? Um, so that's how I kind of remember it, all right? That's how I do it. Um, and the third thing is, is if we can lower them three degrees, but obviously we don't do this, guys. But if you can remember ABC123, okay? The A, the B, the C, again, maximize your oxygenation and ventilation. Don't hyperventilate these guys, by the way. And the last but not least, remember, all of their blood vessels have probably dilated by this point. One to two liters of a crystalloid solution, normal saline, usually fills up the pipes from that relaxation. It also promotes the kidneys to kick back in, all right? So, and again, most people walk around dehydrated. So unless I was, so one to two liters of fluid, unless they're like super duper fluid overloaded, again, that's a game time decision there. If I'm looking down and they got cankles and they got pulmonary edema everywhere every time I bag and I got pink frothy sputum coming up, and eh, probably might not want to do one to two liters of fluid. Just make sure that you tell the doc that you didn't do that, okay? So again, and get your 12 lead. Uh, because the 12 lead is going to help us determine, is this person actually having a heart attack? Did they have any type of cardiac damage because of the arrest? Okay. And again, make sure you treat your hypotension. 
So one to two liters of fluid is usually how we treat the hypotension. The other thing is, is some sort of presser, okay? And uh, presser is the kind of a big one, all right? And I will tell you, Dr. Frank really is a fan of the pressers after arrest, especially if their blood pressure is low. Our pressers, by the way, of course, is dopamine and, of course, an epidrip. So one of those two, okay? He is a huge fan of this, gang. And stop and think about it. After a cardiac arrest, your heart is not pumping like this. It's probably pumping like this, all right? We want to give it some vasoactive support where it's squeezing harder, okay? We want it to do that. All right, uh, again, there are some times when we don't do CPR, we don't attempt a resuscitation. If they are rigor mortis, if they're stiff, if you roll them over and they were like this, and you roll them over and they're still like this, that's called rigor mortis. They've been down far longer than we're going to be able to resuscitate them. Um, one of the things I always did when I had when I assessed my patient was immediately, as soon as they started CPR, shortly after that, I would say, stop, we'd roll them over, see if they actually had clothes on. And it was usually why I was putting the auto pulse on or the, or the, um, or the Lucas device on. Um, and again, if I've got purple back, that means that they've been down for at least 20 minutes, okay? Um, that's called we're not going to resuscitate them, all right? If they have uh, decom decomposition or they've been incinerated or they've been decapitated or they've been cut at the head, neck, or torso, uh, yeah, no amount of CPR that we're going to do is probably going to fix them, okay? The other reason that we would hold uh, CPR is an advanced directive. Um, they have a do not resuscitate. In the state of Florida, that is a yellow piece of paper signed by the physician, signed by the patient, or their advocate. And uh, the biggest problem with that, guys, we talked about it in medical legal a little bit, is that it can be rescinded by either the patient or the family. And that's what usually happens is somebody will want to rescind it. Uh, understand that you are going into very delicate areas right there. Um, stopping a resuscitation. Usually, we, when we start a resuscitation, we end it. But there's a new trend in emergency medicine. And that new trend is to work them at the scene. By the way, I believe in working them at the scene and not just scooping and running with them. Here's why. The scooping and running takes about five to seven minutes. The CPR during that time is, at best, uh, piss poor. It's horrible, okay? It is absolutely horrendous. If you were to look at a monitor of it, it it's absolutely terrible. The best chance that you have to get a resuscitation, to get a ROSC, is at the scene, doing what you do. If they go and say systolic on you, the chances of you getting them back are slim to none. We don't need to carry these people to a hospital and further burden their system. We are very capable of working an assistedly arrest. Very capable, okay? If I've got a cause that is, is cardiac in origin, okay, uh, if I have a successful endotracheal intubation, uh, we have been applying that. We've done this for 25 minutes, four rounds. Uh, some of them are down to even like two rounds of drug therapy. Uh, the EKG remains a systolic or agonal. Uh, if there's blunt trauma victims with the presence or developing a systole. Um, long and short, they're not going to probably resuscitate them at the hospital either, okay? Uh, the, the chances of that happening are very slim. I am actually a big proponent, and I, I will tell you, when it first started, I was a very big opponent to it. I will tell you that I'm more of an opponent, but I think that it is situationally dependent. I think that if I have a V-fib code, the V-fib patient, I think that you've got the best chance of doing it there at the scene. I think that if it's a asystolic code, again, I work it there on scene. My, my argument to it, and a lot of people's argument is, is we could go ahead and transport them to the hospital and then be clear for another call. But again, 
you've you've now committed a hospital to a lot of stuff that again that you could have done while you were there at the scene okay my 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 greatest advocacy of this is again make sure uh, make sure that that it's not something that could be reversed okay um, patients by the way uh, we don't do this with kids kids get transported period they have a chance a better chance of being restored uh, for that okay so they can have longer downtimes and still survive the insult all right um, BLS termination uh, we didn't witness it uh, all the criteria is met they're they're asystolic they're, you've done everything uh, if any of the criteria is missing uh, again, you should go ahead and continue a resuscitation. If you get there and the AED says don't shock, then there's no return of spontaneous circulation prior to transport. Um, I can tell you that a lot of BLS places uh, won't do this. They'll go ahead and work it. Um, I'm kind of 50-50 on that one. Not quite. I don't think that a BLS crew should be calling them dead. Uh, again, go ahead and transport the patient. Um, well, but but an, again, an ALS crew, which has all the tools and toys to make that termination. Okay, so guys, uh, again, you know, stopping the and again. By the way, usually most of these protocols that, that they have for stopping it at the scene uh, also include a consultation with the doctor at, uh, with online medical control. So again, you're you're going to be passing off your bag of crap to somebody else while you do that. Okay, all right. Um, when is it that we would not stop the cardiac arrest? All right. If I have an arrest with a treatable cause, uh, organophosphate poisoning, drug overdose, all right, patients under the age of 18, uh, we need to work this arrest. If the patient is still in VFib, work them, work them, work them. I work them, I've worked a VFib arrest on scene for 20 minutes. And if I still didn't have a result, all right, now let's transport to the hospital, okay? But my best chance of getting that patient back is going to be right then and right there. It's not that we're delaying their care. is that we have a better chance of resuscitating them right there on scene, okay? Uh, if they have a transient, they, they, in other words, they go with a pulse, they get back. They go, that one I need to get going to the hospital, okay? If I, there's neurological viability, if I think that we still have it, uh, hypo... Uh, a hypothermia patient, definitely, okay? A witnessed arrest. If they had a witnessed arrest, uh, probably not a good idea to, to terminate the terminate it there, okay? And the family or other are opposed to the termination of resuscitation. Again, if they're going to if they're gonna fight you, they're going to pull out a gun and try to shoot you because you're going to stop it, eh, go ahead, yeah, terminate. It's a better part of valor taking them to the hospital, all right? Um, remember that if you do decide to terminate your care, your patients are no longer the the patient that you just worked on. The patient's now your family, and, the, and you're going to need to work with them. And then coordinate with the local law enforcement as required for this, okay? Obviously, you're going to have to have the law enforcement there to do any type of, um, of death investigation. Uh, but again, uh, at that point, you're not tying up the hospital resources for somebody who has been down for a very long time and really doesn't have any viability just to take them willy-nilly to the hospital, it's it's a waste of resources. Let's not do it. You're a paramedic now. You're quite capable of handling that. All right, so that's the cardiac arrest. We talked about a whole lot of topics on this one, and uh, I'm going to see you guys on the next video. Oops, got to come in.